Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle, Washington. I'm your host, Carter Umhau, a therapist, artist, and writer. And today we have the privilege of sitting down with Aiko Bethea, who has been working with Opal Leadership for about a year in a consultation and work around kind of their leadership style, leadership skills, and integrating anti-racist work into kind of the fabric of Opal. So we're sitting down with Aiko and Julie Church and Lexi Giblin today, two of Opal's three co-founders, to have a conversation around both what Aiko's work has looked like and what it looks like in general. So we're really excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here with you. So can you start us off and just share a little bit about the work that you do generally and kind of what your career path has looked like up until now? Sure. Currently, I act as an executive coach. It's often for C-level leaders or also my sweet spot that I love doing is working for people who are underrepresented in the spaces that they work in so that they can actually do their best work and also thrive in the spaces that they're in. And I also consult for organizations in terms of helping them to remove barriers to equity. Um, That means looking at their culture. That means looking at their policies and procedures It means how they interface with their clients, customers, consumers, or the rest of the world as well. And I guess when you ask me about how did I get here in terms of my career trajectory, so I am a recovering attorney. Okay. (laughs) And so I practiced law for um, several years from a big firm to um, municipal government to um, moving fully into philanthropic work. I was at the Gates Foundation running a compliance team there for about eight years. And after that, went into executive coaching, thinking that, hey, this is something I probably want to do when I retire. And it ended up being something that I love doing, um, as well as leaning into the equity work. When I was at the Gates Foundation, I was leading some of the first conversations on race across the organization and have always believed that this work in terms of underrepresented people feeling heard, feeling valued was important. And that was before what we call it now, diversity, equity, inclusion was really even a thing, I guess I would say. And so even as a practicing attorney, I always did a lot of pro bono work. I've always tried to work in community in terms of the communities that are most familiar to me and wanted to do it full time when I realized, wow, there's this isolation that people feel when they're the only ones in the room. They're the only woman. They're the only black person. They're the only person of color. They're the only immigrant. They're the only queer person. And it is a barrier to you and the rest of the world. And also organizations don't benefit from your presence when you are using a lot of that energy to cover or to assimilate or to code switch. And I realized that was a need uh, for people to find what is my voice like when it's uniquely mine and for organizations to consider and be structured in a way where they're optimizing all their talent and creating a space where people don't have to cover or armor up, right? And I've enjoyed that. I've seen the benefits in organizations and for specifically for executive clients that I have. So for those who are right now, we hear this conversation where people are saying, what can I do to make my organization more equitable, more C-level? People are seeing that it is incumbent upon them to create a certain type of culture. And the work starts with how do they even come to the work? And there's not a lot of space for people to have conversations about race without it being a gotcha moment or without you being able to really do some introspection. So offering that space for people in a way they can become not only better people who understand themselves, but also better leaders and create better organizations and operationalizing it. And a lot of people don't do that work. So I enjoy it. And I was really excited to be able to work with Opal as well. Yeah, we were very glad that you chose. We feel like we're a smaller organization than others that you've worked with. So we were so glad when you said you thought you could, you could have some of your, bless us with some of your goodness. <laughs> so uh, I a- got a lot out of it too. I will say Carter, that some of the best part is like meeting people mm-hmm. and also learning different dimensions of this work, which is a gift for me. And I mean, you're smaller, but the impact that you have too, and the way that you all came to the work, even in what you, um, were hoping to accomplish was something that I wanted to be a part of. And I'm glad I was able to be a part of it. Is there something particularly around like the work that 
you found yourself doing with Opal that has uh, spoken to you in particular? I'm curious about the way that you just had put that. Yeah, I would say probably a few things. And I don't even know if I spoke with Lexi and Julie and Kara about this later, like my own thoughts or processing about the work during and after. There's a few things I will say initially, it was the fact that they worked in um, healthcare and also about body image and body image in um, in Western world culture, the global North has very much been something that has been a barrier for people who don't have a the traditional body size, which is usually, or even image facial features or what beauty looks like. And that's something that has not been embracing of people of color at all. So I was very interested in the work that they did and realized that this is a lot of the roots of how we decide how we take care for ourselves has so much to do with the shame in society, also systemic barriers in society. So I was very interested in supporting their work in that way, because I think it's a, a mindset that and a support that many people need who don't have access to it. So I was very excited about being able to work with them on that. And I think that I have a different approach to the work than many people or my mindset about the work. Um, right now, Robin D'Angelo's work is really popular with white fragility. And there's a lot of commentary even about white tears and a lot of the um, frustration about the systemic dynamics have always been present. But what I do understand is that there's still the, I do this work not only in service of community and equity, but also in terms of humanity and recognizing that people come to the work with their own experiences in life. And if you don't have that space, regardless of where you are, there will not be progress. And if I have the capacity and bandwidth to create that space of grace and for people to have introspection and be able to have access to other um, experiences in the world, then that's what I'll do, you know, and it's not, I mean, I think right now there is a lot of activism around people with marginalized identities not be, being expected to teach other people or to put the emotional labor in. And that's something that I do for my life's work in terms of I'm paid to do this. I'm not just out here using my emotional capital, but when people are earnestly wanting to do the work, there have to be people who are also willing to guide them through the work yeah. in a way that's earnest to the folks who are most marginalized in this society. It's kind of hard to say, hey, you need to go teach yourself and Google it yourself and then be angry if that what comes up is not something that's in service to people who have been systemically oppressed, right? I'm so struck by, you know, you said earlier that you're a recovering attorney and the way that you just put that is, has just like such a beautiful heart it sounds like your your work is really heart led in that sense or that's the sense that i get from it and from what you shared mm -hmm. and i imagine that you have some perspective around mental health or uh, narrative focus too i hear in your words that contributes to your perspective on on that does that feel true to you so let's be clear i am not a clinician okay. <laughs> i am not a therapist <laughs> I have my own amazing therapist, but I am not a clinician in any way, at shape or form. But I do think that part of how we stay connected with our own humanity is through our own stories and listening to the stories and lived experiences of others. And I think that that is just a gift that we give each other in terms of inviting people to tell their stories and listening and also a gift to ourselves to understand our own stories and to share them. So I think that if you think about narr narrative therapy, I think that we all have a role to play in that when we see each other and we hear each other and we listen and we connect over our lived experiences. How do you integrate that into the consulting and coaching work that you do? Like, how do you lead leaders in understanding themselves or their stories? So I think that not only just for executive coaching, but for equity work, you should have a framing of how you're showing up to the work. Otherwise, um, it's difficult to figure out what your own delta is between equity and how you might be showing up now. So you can't shift it, even though you might be outwardly focusing on shifting the work, shifting my organization. But if you yourself haven't had any type of introspection, it's going to be flawed. 
to a degree. So I think that helping people are creating a clearing, I should say, for people to do that work in a way that is safe and brave at the same time, psychologically safe for them, but brave in terms of pushing their own learning edge and unlearning some things that they may, after they learn more about context and history and impact that they may not feel so good about. And instead of being frozen in shame or uh, projecting in anger or blame, they can move it forward so they become more of the person they want to be and have the impact on others and their organization and the world that they want to have so that they can really live a life that's not, that's not burdened with regret or just hiding or disconnected with yourself and others. Mm -hmm. I think that that's important. I mean, we're all here for connection. And it's important if you don't already know how you're connecting with yourself or how you perceive yourself and what that delta is with other people, how do you connect in a true way? Yeah, yeah. You're making me want to be an executive so I can be coached by you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I coach tons of people who aren't executives. I okay, great. A lot of people in, 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 in group workshops. And that is uh, the space that I really like is community learning. Okay. I like that, yeah. Carter, we have leadership positions open. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wish you'd told me earlier. <laughs> so, you know, obviously I'm not, I haven't been in the room with you guys before when you all have been working together, but Julie and Lexi, I'd love to hear a little bit of your insider perspective on, on what it's been like to work with ICO. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that we came to our conversations with ICO with very little confidence and we were probably in more of a place of shame and that shame was causing us to hide. And I think what Ico did was kind of drew us out of that through kind of treating us with such kindness and grace and patience, a dose of education as well. And, and also helping us understand our stories and how those stories connect to this moment and who we are now and what we will take into our work. Because I can certainly like feel the difference between sort of it being uh, the work of anti-racism work being more of a head work, you know, cognitive, like, okay, I got to get this done. I got to move this way versus it just being part of your, part of who you are and part of how you're thinking and seeing the world. And then it just flows. It's not something you, you don't have to turn on or off. It's just right there in your heart. And it's, it's part of your vision and what you're seeing everywhere. So I feel like that's what what happened for Julie, Kara, and I over the course of our work with ICO, is this kind of be owning who we are um, more and feeling more confident in asserting ourselves and having a voice at Opal around anti-racism work. Mm -hmm. And still, I would say still happening, right? Like I feel like there's still these moments of learning and her wisdom and hard questions and support is still happening. And I feel thankful for that. I think earlier when, when Aiko was talking through her acceptance that her work and what she's paid for is of helping and supporting white people through this process and learning about what it means to be white and how, what it means to do this anti-racism work and look at the reality of our country's history and all of that. I, I got emotional and teary because I really yeah, I'm getting emotional again, but I did, f I feel that. I feel so grateful that the timing, especially of our conversations allowed some white tears, <laughs> um, if you want to call it that, but Aiko was, was accepting of that and allowed for the growth in us through that time. So it's, it just is, is priceless. I would say that we found each other at the time that we did in, in this season of a country's history and, and Opal's story. So I, yeah, I, I just feel thankful for the leadership in that way and the care in which I go. And I, I think in that being able to share things that I would say brought shame up in me um, in our coaching sessions that then would bring tears because of my shame and navigating, ah, I'm, I don't want to talk about this, <laughs> but I go leaving space for me to do that. I, I, feel very much so I'll have, I give a lot of gratitude and credit to the growth in me because of these spaces that she's created for me. So I, 
I can't under, I don't know. I just, I can't overstate that, honestly. And I know um, I can think of just times in the, most, in the last couple of weeks where Julie, Kara, and I are taking so many risks right now as it relates to um, policy procedures, <laughs> I, I just regularly. And so the, the, the um, shame is commonly felt among the three of us right now. You know, we'll, we'll try to take a risk on something and then it'll be received in a certain way that we didn't, weren't aware of and we'll get feedback about our blind spots. And, and then, you know, the initial kind of wave of shame will come over us and then our work of going to each other and saying, I feel so ashamed of this, you know, just talking to each other, like outing, outing the shame that we're feeling, I think is like everything and being able to keep doing this work. Cause this is not, we don't see this as a, you know, this isn't just a season of work. This is our life, our lifelong work. And without the shame resilience work, I think I'd probably be in bed right now with my head <laughs> covers over my head because it is really painful. <laughs> yeah. Iko, I'd love to hear from you, like how you, how you think about sort of the need for shame resilience within the work that you do and, and like where you've sort of brought that into the, the executive coaching that you do conceptually even. So I would say that for this work, I and I was talking to um, a community of um, it was mainly people of color. And, you know, we talk a lot about just how shame stops us from showing up at times and how a lot of the, the systems and our history in this country is doing exactly what it was designed to do. Right. It, I mean, it, the shame not only as people of color here, but also in terms of for any white people who are trying to do the work of undoing racism, there is the shame there that will make you stop. So what Lexi was alluding to, like you just stop and you want to hide and you want to, you know, get under the blankets or sometimes it turns into anger. Now I'm, at ang I'm angry at other people versus understanding where is this coming from? And how do I put it down so it's not dictating who I am and who I'm going to be? And it's not dictating what I'm going to do in this moment and what's possible for me to do in the next moment. And I think that there are two things that are such strongholds on us that prevent us from becoming the people we want to be in terms of anti-racist or people who deserve to be seen and to thrive in the society, not just to survive. And I see those as being, those two strongholds as being shame and grief. And what Lexley named about shame uh, in terms of saying, when you're feeling it, you have to name it and you have to out it. And that's how you take the power of it away. And that was the magic of working with all three of them as founders together, working with them individually and then together so that they could do their individual work, but they had the support of one another to say, hey, I'm feeling shame right now. And how are you feeling? I'm feeling shame because. So naming it so that you can dismantle it and it cannot dictate how you're going to show up and it doesn't stop you from progressing forward. And similarly for other people who this country was created to shame or to marginalize, for people to name, I'm feeling shame right now because X and wow, that doesn't make any sense because I know that this isn't a true narrative about who I am. I know that this isn't what my intention was. And I know that I'm more than this. Mm -hmm. And when you name it, you can counter it and move forward in a way of intentionality versus default. Mm -hmm. The default in this country is to be racist. That's how our country was created and how systems are built. The default is to be, you know, paternalistic. And that's how our system was created in our history. So it's doing exactly what it's designed to do, but you have to unlearn and undo it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the work that's important. The second one is grief. So we don't have a lot of space in this country to grieve unless somebody dies. And even then it's like, hurry up and do that grief thing and move on. <laughs> and grief is really about loss. And anybody who has, for the example, in this society lost somebody, you know that the grief doesn't just stop after the funeral. 
it creeps up on you, it sneaks up in you and it washes over you. And there's grief in every moment of loss. So in this work of equity work and DEI work, an example can be if you are somebody who is white and you're learning your privilege, you're learning, wow, the system is harmful. Wow, you're learning that some of the things you may have said or done before were racist or harmful, then you grieve the innocence of not knowing and the freedom of not knowing or not recognizing that, wow, I'm raising my kids around all white people. I'm a part of this. How could I? There's like grief in that and there's shame in it. And there's the idea of, wow, my church, wow, really racist. I can't believe this. I can't believe they said it because the more you learn, the more you realize you have to unlearn. And you have and moving forward in a way where shame and grief aren't paralyzing you and stopping you from moving forward. And the text that I use oftentimes with clients, and we used it, was the Racial Healing Handbook, which has a whole chapter on grief. So it's that important in terms of the shifting who you are and even grieving the person you were who, you know, for many people, it's like a person who had privilege and I didn't have to think about all this stuff. You know, it's hard to think about all of these things. I remember when I went to um, I went to Smith, which is a women's college. And I remember being even angry sometimes because I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't even watch a Disney movie now without seeing that. Why did they make Ariel have those big boobs? And why is her waist like this? And why are they just told this is so much misogynistic and Lion King? Why do the, you know, hyenas sound like, you know, they're this caricature of black people or poor people. I noticed that one without going to Smith, but it's like the more you see it's taxing, it's emotionally taxing. And who doesn't want to have an existence without that? Yeah. It's tiresome and it's a lot to carry. Yeah. But I think that for many of us who have different privileged identities, we the sacrifice is putting down that privilege in a sense of the privilege of just innocence and being free and you know, light to carrying the burden with others as well. And that's the tax that you pay, but it is also a way to live without regret and to be closer to the person who you want to be. Yeah. And I think that that is really powerful. So I think about grief and shame and the work of Brene Brown has absolutely influenced me as well because she gave us so much language around shame and really a formula of thinking about, well, now that I know what it is, what do I do with it? And that work around empathy and recognizing, oh man, I'm projecting and I'm blaming now versus I want to lean in and be empathetic. And for me, the question is always, who do I want to be? Mm. You know, yeah, I'm angry about a lot of stuff. Yeah, but but who do I want to be? Mm. And it empowers me to think about how do I move forward and show up in a way to be the person who I want to be. One thing that we've talked about on this podcast quite a bit is self-inquiry work related to radically open dialectical behavioral therapy. And I go one piece that I've been I've been trying out with my with shame when it's come up with anti-racism is going to self-inquiry work in response to my shame. So I I might feel just a wave of shame for a bit and then maybe out it to Julie or Kara or someone in my, whoever I can grab, <laughs> who I feel safe enough with, you know, and then, and then kind of getting into this question of like, what's the learning here for me? What is, what is the growth here? I think it's what you're getting at, like that question is getting at, who do I want to be? And how, what, what is this, what is this shame trying to teach me? If I can, if I can set aside the pain of the emotion that I'm feeling and just think about what happened and what the learning is, I can sort of, that kind of can get me through the shame, the outing and the understanding what the learning is can move me, move me through it in a way that, that being silent with it would just absolutely never, I wouldn't, I would be nowhere. You know, I think I'd be, I'd be um, hidden, you know, I wouldn't be, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> it wouldn't be good. Yeah, and one thing I want to call out about what you said, you said uh, the naming Mm-hmm. And then the learning from it, like, what do I need to unlearn or what do I need to learn from this? Mm-hmm. But the other part that you mentioned, but we didn't identify was the connection with somebody else over it in terms of getting the empathy to yeah. like being able to speak with somebody and connect over and have true empathy. Yeah. So the shame is 
experiencing the shame and naming it is helping you to actually create connection versus just having the shame and sitting with it and hiding and creating disconnect. Right. I, it's, it's so much about that, that connection and not being alone and knowing that they've come to me too, you know, with their shame and we're in this together. And then, you know, some things that you said that, that we're carrying this with others and then we're grieving with others, you know, the, the collective, the experience of emotion and community is very, yeah, very much part of what we, what we learn from Igo's work with us. Yeah. And, yep. and I have to say that something that I get from this to the work, um, because there's definitely the question that I get about, oh, you know, you're working at a community. It's not really hard to work with white people. Isn't it really hard and frustrating? And granted, I make sure that I'm very aware of my bandwidth, right? Because I yeah. want the experience to be positive on both sides because I, you know, I don't live in a vacuum. So I have my own anger, my own things I have to work through in the way that the system works. But but there is a part of it that is about teaching me to lean into empathy and to exercise grace. Because without having these moments, even the space that it seems like I'm holding for other people, you're holding for me because I'm also learning and connecting with somebody else's humanity. And it allows me to have a deeper well of empathy and grace also. Mm. Versus if I were just siloed and it's like, I'm only going to work with people who have the same experience as me and we can all bond over it. And I get it versus saying I, I, I am connecting across cultures and with other people and to understand and recognizing seeing other people's humanity. It creates this, this deeper well for me and also my own increased vulnerability tolerance as well. That's such that's such a beautiful thing. I feel like I've been really inspired by a lot of the words that you've put to this. And I've also found myself really struck by by the fact that you're you're doing so much work to hold and help unpack the stories of of what I'm assuming is typically white leadership in different settings and spaces that you're working for and with. While also you named earlier having such a passion for kind of creating space and protection in a way too for the person that is the only one like you like you mm -hmm. named and I guess I'm imagining sort of the connection here between like allowing space for exploration and uh, empathy building and shame resilience work with leadership as being one that then creates a space that assumes curiosity and an openness on behalf of that leadership's employees so that that only one or the the person or the group of people that might be marginalized at work have cut maybe a better shot at not having to feel some of the the hardship of of being unseen does that feel like it's true to you and and what you do or would you put other words to it yeah so there's probably a few other layers here like yeah. oftentimes the leaders that i'm working with you know they are women they are people of color and okay. they're sitting in the C-suite, but they may be the only one amongst either their leadership team or in their peer group of other CEOs, or they're the unexpected person there. So they may be sitting in the seat of leadership. And there's even that idea of how do I show up and be myself? How do I show up and know that there are people who have this range of expectations of me? And I think that cutting through that process is that first and foremost most step of, what are the expectations I have of me and why? And do the expectations I have of myself align with who I want to be and who I am versus being pulled by all of these different, you know, values, needs, constituents. And many times leaders don't have that space to do that work of what are my expectations of myself? Oftentimes, especially with high performers, you might see that, you know, they're, they're driven, but there's also a degree of a playbook of how you get there in the society. You speak a certain way, you network and relationship build in a certain way. I think that if you ask anybody about what are the connector sports for leadership, people would say things like tennis and golf, <laughs> right? So there is this playbook. So how do you unlearn and undo that? And it looks different if you are categorically, systemically, somebody who is not a prototype from that world. Because now there's a lot of other layers and mixed signals happening. 
And then it looks another way for somebody who only knows showing up looking like this in this way. And how do you give somebody a different, how do you paint this different narrative and um, experience that perhaps at least 20%, if not more of their organization is experiencing? So I, I don't do the work. I would be really clear that I do not do the work of crises work where something has gone seriously awry and it's in the newspapers. I don't do the work of making the case for why DEI is important. Yes, in many ways, it makes me feel like I'm like doing the work of justifying my own existence. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you need to figure that out before you come to me so that I know that you want to do it. There are other people who do that. And I don't do things like one-off training. Because those three categories of work are all things that make the work unsustainable. You're going to do a one-off training that's not connected to strategy or long-term vision at all. And it's not a silver bullet. You're going to do work that's only happening in reaction to a crisis versus who we truly want to be. And, oh, by the way, convince us to do this work. And why is it even important? And how do we sustain it? So those are three bodies of work I absolutely do not do. But it also means that I am living into my own values. Like there's transactional work and there's transformational work. And I do do some work that is very much uh, transactional because I know that that's also a portal for people to get to transformational, but not in those kind of categories. But the transformational work are some of the things we're talking about now is the introspection, the self-inquiry, the recognizing and naming shame and grief, practicing empathy and self-compassion. So those are things that are transformational. And that's what I think is the long haul in terms of what shifts us as people so that you don't have to have a playbook and compliance measures and HR and all these other things to tell you what to do versus you're showing up and living it intuitively. And you're able to hear and listen when others are being hurt by it or it's not having the impact you want. Yeah. As you were sharing that, I go, I thought of a a moment when I was, or a time when I I came to you with some feeling um, upset by how others were experiencing me in some way or the feedback I'd gotten. And something I think you you said to me was some, it was something like, well, you know who you are, you know, you, you know, you know where you are on this issue. So you've got lots of people feeling, thinking in different ways about you you know, this is, but you know, you know where your center is, you know what you're, what you're about and people are going to kind of have all kinds of different thoughts and feelings in reaction to you, but stay centered in who, who you want to be. And that's been, I think I, that's another piece that I've taken with me that I just kind of centering on not so much about whatever other, everybody's thinking, but more looking at who I want to be and moving, moving from that as my source rather than getting, getting flung about by the opinions of others or what I heard about someone saying, you know, through someone else that came to me. So I think there's a lot to that. And I think there's, um, in terms of our socialization around people pleasing and wanting to just be what everyone else wants us to be. And, and the shame resilience work of really focusing in on, no, you know, let me get let me get clear on who, who am I and who do I wanna be? and set aside the rest. Mm-hmm. When I'm hearing you talk too, I know that we're staying in the world of work and career and business or leadership, but I just can't help but think all of these same things are just true, right? It's just about human relationship and community. And so just thinking through family or thinking through community or a neighborhood or other aspects of that, I just think it is translatable in terms of how folks can use these skills or these approaches or some of this language to bring that in if if what they're thinking about being a parent or something there's there's ways that one can use some of these things in how one takes in the feedback from children versus how they're gonna stand strong of like wait I know who I am (laughs) so I was just thinking about some of those other ways to to take what we're talking about beyond even the workplace yeah, absolutely. And I, that's a part of recognizing we're whole people. It's not all of a sudden we become somebody else when we get to work and honoring that people have so many dimensions to themselves. Yeah. So I think that is part of that workplace of inviting people to be able to come in and still recognize that there's a whole other world out there that you're bringing in with you. Mm. And that's been something that has been a learning for, I think, a lot of people. We have this idea of you come to work and you're professional and you have to 
compartmentalize and have impact versus recognizing that people are going to have impact when they're seeing people who look like them being shot every day. People are going to have impact and they're really not going to be optimal either if you know, their leader used that word that has all these implications about who they are and how they're valued or not valued. So in terms of doing the work and the value and the impact, it's like we don't have these responses because of a policy at work. We have these policies because we're live we're people who are living and have existence outside of outside of this. And I just want to go back to with what something that Lexi said to you about the self-inquiry part and going back to yourself. That's the work that you all did. Like I may have asked the questions, but you couldn't go back and go back and say, is this who I want to be? Unless you gave yourself the space to think about who do I want to be instead of just being a person by default here, which would have so many meanings about being a woman, being white, being a white woman, right? And business owners versus saying, but wait, who do I say that I am and who I want to be? Like you can only ask that question back to yourself if you've done the work to answer it and to figure out what that answer is. And you all are the ones who did that work. And that meant having some painful conversations. That meant when did, how did my racial identity, how is it created? How did I get this message about who I am and what whiteness is and what role is that? And that's the work that a lot of women and feminists have to do. Like, wait, who am I? And who do I say I am as a woman? And who do I want to be versus what society says I can or cannot be? So we're not, you know, single issue people, as Audre Lorde would say, but we're complex and we have to look at ourselves in all these spaces and name who am I and who do I want to be? Thank you so much, Aiko, for joining us today. I am excited about our listeners being able to hear this conversation. I think that it's going to be inspiring to them, whether they are in leadership or just simply people, which they all are. I hope we don't have any bots <laughs> listening or something, but um, I just, I know that you, you do clearly so much like heartfelt work that is clearly really transformational for the people that you work with. And I feel grateful that we have gotten to sit with you today and hear more about it. And that also that Opal Leadership has gotten to work with you too. So thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So if others wanted to find you or follow along with your work, how could they do that? So they can find me on Instagram at rare underscore coach or at my website, rarecoaching.net, where I offer workshops for um, some of that are just for people of color and some that are for other people who are learning and growing. And then, of course, my executive coaching practice. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to all of our listeners for joining us today. If you want to learn more about Opal, you can also follow along with us on social media at Opal Food and Body on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or look at our website, opalfoodandbody.com for information on our programming and our community events. Thank you to David Bozzi for editing, to Erin Davidson for the Appetites Original Music, and to Camille Dodson for all of her work in organizing the podcast. Thanks again and join us next time.